This video is to help you understand a little bit about the buffer overflow problems you'll be encountering and exploiting on uh, one of the assignments, one of the programming assignments. Uh, let's start off by talking about what a buffer overflow is. Uh, primarily, this happens because C doesn't check array bounds. Uh, and what happens is that when we take input from, example, the keyboard, uh, we don't specify uh, a limit on the amount of input. So as we fill up a buffer with the input we're taking, each keystroke from the keyboard, we can actually go past the end of an array that we're using as our input buffer uh, to store each of those characters. And this, is, was, this was a very common type of security vulnerability. Uh, what we'll go over in this video is uh, how this stack is laid out and the address space uh, in general uh, that allows this, allowed this to happen, how input buffers are put on the stack, and then how overflowing the buffer can help us inject unwanted code into our program. And then we'll close with uh, what are now defenses against buffer overflows that have prevented this kind of vulnerability. Okay, so remember the uh, Linux memory layout. Um, we have a stack that grows from the high end of memory downward. Uh, and then we have uh, our program, our programs, uh, static data and dynamic data uh, at the uh, bottom addresses with the dynamic data growing upward. Okay, remember the, the dynamic data is allocated using malloc or new or other uh, uh, memory allocation primitives like that, the stack is allocated by uh, making procedure calls and what each procedure needs to place on the stack. Things like local variables, uh, arguments for the next procedure call, and so on. Okay. So uh, just to reiterate that point, here's an example uh, program, uh, and let's see where everything actually ends up going in memory. Uh, you can see that this program has a couple of big chunks of memory, two big arrays allocated at the top, some variables of various types, some ints and pointers, uh, and then a couple of uh, a couple of procedures, some of which uh, have statements that do some dynamic uh, memory allocation. So let's take a look at where those things uh, all end up in memory. Um, we'll start with. Uh, of course, our main procedure and our useless procedure, they end up in the text portion of memory. That's where we'll have the, ins the assembly instructions for those procedures. Then there's some static data, uh, including those big arrays and the variables we declared. That space will be allocated here uh, even prior to running the program. We'll know in advance how much space we need there. Then there's parts of the program, of course, those uh, malloc uh, arrays that allocate memory when it's needed, and that'll come from the heap space. That'll continue to grow upward. And of course, we can free up that space when we don't need it anymore and uh, use it for other things. Uh, our stack pointer, of, po of course, points to the uh, top of the stack. Uh, and we also have some uh, libraries, uh, for example, the malloc routine, uh, that we've linked at, uh, at runtime. And that usually sits in this area down here. Okay, so that's where things are ending up in memory. And what happened in the um, late 80s is a program was created that uh, could actually uh, attack a, a lot of internet hosts um, by exploiting the way that this uh, memory allocation was done and the way that memory was arranged. Uh, because the stack grows uh, backwards in memory, uh, and data and instructions are stored in the same memory, uh, we could do an interesting uh, attack that could help us take control of uh, someone's machine. Uh, let's see how, how this happened. Okay, the stack was based, uh, the, the internet worm was based on a stack buffer overflow exploit. Okay, and again, as I mentioned at the beginning, it's because many Unix functions do not check argument sizes. So they'll just allow us to fill and overfill or overflow a buffer uh, for our input. Let's take a look at a common function in Linux, uh, the getS function, 
uh, which is used to uh, get an input string uh, from the keyboard. You'll notice that the function uh, returns a pointer uh, to a character buffer, a character a buffer of bytes, and it takes as its argument uh, the start of that uh, of that buffer. Okay, so let's uh, let's walk through uh, this code real quickly. You'll see it starts off by getting a character from the keyboard, a single character, and uh, setting the uh, setting a pointer to. Uh, the destination uh, address, and then asks, is this character uh, so something that would, if something that is not the end of file and not a, a, a new line uh, or return? And if it isn't, in other words, if it's just some other character, then it will uh, put that character at where the pointer is pointing, the dereferencing the pointer, and then it increments the pointer by one. Uh, which, because of pointer arithmetic, will point to the next place in the buffer. In this case, they're characters. It will increment by one. And then it just calls get character again and repeats the loop, uh, asking if, again, we've reached a return or an end of file. Uh, when we're done, it adds one more thing to the end of the string, namely the null character, because remember in C, we indicate the end of a string with a null. And then uh, finally, just returns that same address it started with as the place where it placed uh, the input characters. Okay. So, what could go wrong in this code? Well, you can see that uh, how big is this buffer? Uh, we don't know because we're just given its starting address here. Uh, we have no idea how much space was allocated in memory for this buffer. Uh, we're just going to keep putting things in it until as long as there's more input and we'll keep going. All right, so in fact there's no way to specify the limit on the number of characters to read as defined. Uh, and this is a problem in many, a uh, similar problem in many other Linux functions like string copy which is just given two addresses and says copy a string from here to there but doesn't bother to check that the destination can hold that length uh, string. Similarly in, uh, in scanf uh, these are functions used to get input from the keyboard. We have a similar uh, kind of uh, problem uh, as it gets strings of unknown size. All right, so let's uh, do the smallest possible example we can that can show this off. Here we have a simple C function called uh, echo. It's called from main. You notice here, uh, uh, main uh, prints type a string and then asks us to input a string. And the function echo is just going to echo it back to the uh, console after we hit return. All right, so we will first read a string and then uh, write the string back out to the console after we're done. So um, how big is the buffer? Well, we've decided on a buffer of size four, just four bytes, a pretty small uh, buffer. But let's see uh, what happens uh, when we run this code, okay? So I'm going to run this code and type the string 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. You notice I've typed eight characters, not four. I've gone past the end of that buffer and written into other parts of memory. Uh, we'll see in a second where those are. And uh, there's a segmentation fault. The, the, uh, we tried to, somehow our CPU tries to use an address it shouldn't, and the system complains and says, uh, you have a fault here. Something went terribly wrong. But now, if we type the string 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, you notice that's only one shorter, but still greater than 4. Uh, it'll echo it just fine. It'll just print that right back out. Well, why didn't that cause a problem? That overflowed the buffer as well. And if we type the string uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, A, B, C, of course, we'll keep getting uh, segmentation faults as these uh, strings overflow the buffer. So let's take a look for each of these cases, just uh, what is going on, what is happening uh, in the system. To start, let's uh, review the, uh, the assembly code that might be generated by echo. You'll notice here there's just some that usual setup stuff at the beginning and cleanup stuff at the end. And in between, uh, we compute an address uh, that we're going to uh, use for uh, 
some purposes, allocate some space on the stack, uh, save that value onto the stack, and then call getS. When getS returns, uh, we are just going to basically call uh, putS uh, right after it uh, to echo the values, then uh, reclaim our stack and return. What are, we, what are we putting on the stack? Uh, well, we're probably allocating some space for the buffer as well as other things. Okay. Remember that buffer was of size uh, 4 bytes. Uh, the code down here in the pink region is the code that we might see in main uh, that calls echo, then does something else, and eventually uh, cleans up and returns. Okay. So uh, before we execute that call to get us in uh, echo that occurs here, uh, this is likely what's going to be on the stack. There will have been a stack frame for the main procedure. And then, of course, when main called echo, it placed the return address uh, on the stack. That would be uh, the return to the next line after the call to echo. And then we see the stack frame for, uh, for the echo function. All right. And that involves uh, pushing EBP onto the stack. Uh, that happens here. Uh, then we also push uh, EBX onto the stack. So we see that there. And then there's some space allocated for our four-character buffer uh, on the stack. And that's uh, computed at this uh, location here. Uh, the address of the stack, you'll notice, is the current EBP minus eight bytes is the address of uh, the buffer. Uh, this function may also allocate some other space on the stack. Uh, the last thing that's put on the stack is the argument to, uh, to get us, namely the address of the buffer. So let's see what, is, uh, what that stack looks like just before we go to get, it, uh, to get us. Again, we've allocated, um, we've placed an EBP onto the stack, the old EBP onto the stack. That's pointing to some uh, earlier place in the stack frame. Um, you notice here the address is FFC658. That would be maybe the start of the uh, of the of mains of uh, stack frame. Uh, our buffer is here, and remember we have to think about it as not having any particular values in it at this point. We haven't written anything to those locations yet. And then we have uh, put the address of the buffer as the argument to uh, get us. Okay, and that's uh, placed on the stack just before we do that uh, call. Um, finally, the return address uh, from when we're done with Echo is uh, 040885F7, which is the address in main for the instruction after the call to Echo, where we will be returning. All right, so this is what our stack uh, looks like at this point. Um, let's see what happens next. As we enter the characters 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, followed by a return, uh, one of our examples there for uh, our input, you'll notice that we'll fill the buffer with the ASCII codes for each of the characters. There's the 1, the 2, the 3, the 4, all the way to the 7, closing with that null with that null uh, byte to indicate the end of the string. Now, you've noticed that we've overrun our buffer. We haven't just filled the four bytes. We've filled eight bytes and uh, overwritten EBX, that, uh, the, uh, va the save value of EBX that had been stored on the stack. That might cause some problems later on if we needed that value. Uh, but it turns out, in this case, that's not an issue. And we can return just fine uh, after uh, this call. The, uh, the return address hasn't been affected. Uh, the save value of EBP hasn't been affected. Everything can still uh, function properly. And that's why we actually uh, print that string correctly. Uh, we're able to do that. Now, if we add one more character and put in an input of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, you'll notice that we'll overwrite part of the saved uh, EBP. So now, rather than being uh, the frame being reset correctly for main to point to the beginning, it'll be pointing to the wrong location, 00FF instead of FFFF. Uh, and uh, that will cause that segmentation fault uh, that we'll see uh, happen later uh, 
uh, because when we pop EBP in the leave instruction uh, from ECHO, we'll get the wrong value and main's stack frame will be improperly uh, addressed. When we put in the longer string, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, A, B, C, we now go even further and not only overrun the buffer and the saved EBX and the saved EBP, we actually also change a byte of the return address. So now when we go to return from echo, we're not even going to return to the main procedure anymore. Uh, we're going to return to another address rather than going to 0804.85F7, we're going to go to 0004.85F7. And that will Def, who knows what we will find there. So that's uh, the main problem with this uh, buffer overflow is we start destroying data that is on the stack. Both the stack frame, uh, the stack frame discipline is broken. We destroy the return addresses. We return, restore this, uh, potentially destroy some frame pointers. Okay, so how can we use this maliciously to get the machine to do whatever we want? Uh, well, what we can do is uh, input a string that n isn't just simple characters, but actually are the bytes that could represent some executable code. So that as we go back and uh, overwrite that buffer, we can ac uh, overrun that buffer and go and write over the uh, return address. We can actually change the return address to point into the area that we just wrote. So rather than, uh, let's take a look at this situation here, where we have this function bar uh, that we're calling, and it's supposed to be returning, of course, to the address immediately after bar. Let's call that A. That was the re that's the return address we place on the stack. But then we call bar, and it does that uh, buffer allocation and allows us to overrun the buffer. We could actually go as far as inserting code uh, into the buffer so that we put some special code here of our own as well as continuing down to overrun where the return address A was stored and change it to be address B. So we get rid of A and, and put the address B. The address B is just going to be the start of our buffer where we've put our own code. And so now rather than returning to this address here in the function foo, uh, we're going to return uh, erroneously to part of our stack where we've injected some special code uh, that we'll execute uh, for our own purposes. And this is how we end up hijacking a machine. Uh, we basically overrun its stack uh, and write our own code in there and force uh, a jump uh, to that location. All right, so that's what we're going to be doing in, uh, in one of our programming assignments uh, is uh, writing code to do this. Now, this worked in machines of the late 80s, early 90s. Um, it doesn't really work today. But uh, the way that Internet Worm does is it took advantage of a function in Linux called uh, Finger, uh, which takes a, somebody's email address and would tell you whether they were logged in uh, to the machine or not and how long they might have been idle. Um, so it used get s to get that input. And so instead of providing that, sim that correct input, of that would probably only be of a maybe 64-byte length or so, we could actually put in something that was much, much longer that included some exploit code, uh, the code we actually want to have run, some padding uh, to get us as far as we need to go to make sure to overwrite the return address, and then that new return address that would actually be the start of the exploit code, all right? Uh, and uh, then that would allow us to take over the victim's machine. So buffer overflow exploits were really uh, common in the late 80s, early 90s. Uh, what has happened since then? Well, we've uh, gone in and changed those Linux libraries, uh, that, like the getS function. We now use uh, fgetS. Uh, which is a, uh, a function that's been defined to have an additional argument uh, which specifies the size of the buffer. So we will not read any more characters than that limit. Uh, therefore, we can now uh, stop 
before we get to the end of the buffer and know that we're not overriding any other areas. Uh, similarly, string copy is another function that's been modified. It's now, uh, there's a version called string n copy, uh, where the n uh, argument specifies the size of the string to copy, so we don't copy some long string into the space for a smaller one and overrun that. Uh, similarly, scanf has been changed so that rather than having the percent %s specification that just read a string of arbitrary size, it now uses f get s with uh, percent %ns, uh, which says uh, read a string but of size n maximum. Uh, again, limiting the size of that input. Uh, but there's been some other changes as well. Uh, some system level protections. Uh, one is to get the compiler to consider um, randomizing the stack offsets, the size of the frames in each stack frame, so that it is difficult to, for an attacker to know how much padding to add because every time uh, the procedure is called, it adds a slightly, uh, it makes a frame of a slightly different size. Uh, so that it makes it difficult for, uh, to predict the size of that code and where we're going to get that uh, return address that we want to uh, be able to jump to the exploit code to be just uh, at the right place. It uh, becomes very hard to do that. Uh, so, uh, people have also developed techniques for uh, detecting stack corruption, uh, checking the stack before and after procedure calls uh, that it might be sensitive. Uh, to these buffer overflow exploits uh, to check that the stack has not been changed. And then finally, some hardware modifications uh, to create some non-executable uh, areas of memory. So that, for example, the portion of the memory or the segment of the memory that the stack occupies uh, would be set to be non-executable, meaning that whenever we read data from this area, we cannot interpret it as instructions. So now, even if we're able to fill a buffer with uh, exploit code and uh, in insert the uh, address in the right place so we can jump to that code, uh, we still can't execute it. Uh, the system will not interpret that stuff as uh, instructions, but will insist on saying the stuff on the stack has to be interpreted as data, not as, uh, as code. For your programming assignment, you'll be working with a virtual machine that is of the late 80s, early 90s vintage, so you'll be able to write a buffer flow exploit. Uh, but you should know that, of course, that is not the case any longer, and uh, that type of attack is no longer possible. Um, but good luck with the programming assignment, and uh, you should really enjoy it and see how you can inject code into a program uh, that wasn't meant to have that code in it to begin with. Have fun.